So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. So I uh, welcome you all to this uh, ACNS one uh, webinars on Sundays. So uh, on behalf of the Educational Committee and on behalf of the Professor Carter, I would like to welcome all the uh, chairs, uh, speakers, and also um, and also the audience. So uh, today uh, we have uh, three uh, lectures today. The first one is by our expert speaker, Professor Takahiro Ota, We'll be talking about the basic functional arterial anatomy of the brain. Our next one is, uh, speaker is Dr. Lesmin Ahmed. We'll be talking about fluorescent light assisted resection of high grade gliomas, our experience in Ibrahim Kardec Hospital and Research Institute. The third expert speaker is uh, Professor Kiris. who will be talking about history of microvascular laboratory practice and Pascal Microvascular Bypass Training Curriculum. So to chair our session, we have uh, Professor uh, Hidehiro uh, Kimura, who is the Associate Professor, Department of Neurosurgery of the Kobe University Graduate School of Medicine in Kobe, in Japan. Our discussion today is uh, Professor Dupo, who is the Professor and Unit Head of Department of Neurosurgery, NIMHANS, in uh, Bengaluru, uh, Karnataka in, in India. And also uh, Professor Ashra is uh, also our uh, discussion today, who is the Chief of uh, Neurovascular and Neuro and Neurovascular Therapy Center, Department of Neurosurgery, Faculty of Medicine of Universitas uh, Agnan uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Surabaya. So to moderate this uh, section, so uh, along, along with me, we have uh, Dr. Atik, Dr. Uh, Esru and uh, Dr. Joey Sam. So shall I pass the uh, pass the floor to our chair, uh, Professor uh, Kimura, to introduce our first speaker. Uh, please, Kimura Sensei. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Raja and Ben and Ryu and uh, you for your kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Good evening and good afternoon. I'm Hidehito Kimura, Kobe University of Japan. It's a great honor for me to to chair today's webinar as well. I I, I greatly thank ACN's president, Professor Yoko Kato, and Roger, and Ryu, and Ben. I'm glad to see you again. I'm very glad to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Takahiro Ota, from Tokyo Metropolitan Tama Medical Center. Today, he will talk about the basic anatomical arterial anatomy of the brain. He is a very, very famous and expert, expert um, vascular neurosurgeon interventionalist. And today he will uh, talk about the in detail bas anatomical structure of the arterial brain, brain artery. So please start your presentation when you are ready. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kimura for introducing me and uh, Good evening, everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank to Professor Liu and Professor Yoko Kato for inviting me as a, a lecturer today. So I'm a neurosurgeon, a so-called hybrid neurosurgeon or drug trained or drug practicing vascular neurosurgeon, not anatomist, not radiologist, but uh, some knowledge of the embryology is very important for us neurosurgeon and neurointerventionalist. So today I will some, pick up some of the topics about embryology and functional arterial anatomy of the brain. So may I share my presentation now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Takahiro Uta from Japan. I'm glad to have a chance to tell you about basic functional artery anatomy of brain. No COI? I have the impression that people are a bit dismissive when hear the word embryology. Today's presentation includes some topics of embryology. I have one question. Why embryology is important for neurosurgeon and neurointerventionalists? From the embryological view, the basic patterns of the cerebral arteries development are highly conserved across vertebrates. So, embryology gives 
as essential key to understand the pathogenesis of rare variants or disease. This is an outline of my presentation. The functional artery anatomy of brain covers a vast number of topics, so today I will discuss a few of them. First, I will give you a discussion about the circle of Willis. Then I will show you the aortic arch development and some examples of great vessels. Third, the anterior perforating artery is a topic. Finally, I will show you some cases with the anastomosis between the ophthalmic artery and middle meningeal artery. Let's start with the circle of Willis. I don't know how many audiences is familiar with vascular supply to the brain. May I start with a basic anatomical illustration showing the left figure. Carotid artery supplies to the brain. Bilaterally, vertebral arteries run through the vertebral foramen and intracranially fuses to become a basilar artery, which supplies mainly the brain stem and the cerebellum. If you look at uh, scar base in the right figure, vertebral artery fuses at the midline and forms a basilar artery and then bilateral posterior cerebral artery. Carotid artery branches anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery. Posterior cerebral artery is supplied from carotid artery or basilar artery. Look at the arteries at the skull base. Everyone has the circle of Willis. This is ACOM, ACA, ICA, PCOM, and basilar artery. This is the circle of Willis. Right figure is a famous illustration from the original article published in 1664, more than 350 years before. Thomas Willis was an old British anatomist. He is not the first man who described about the artery circle at the skull base, but he described the circle from the viewpoint of functional vascular anatomy. Sometimes looking at old original books can be stimulating for those of us who study them. Let's see the circle of Willis in other vertebrates. In fish and amphibian, the anterior circle is open. On the other hand, in reptile and avian, the circle is closed. Is it interesting? And two basal artery can be seen in fish and reptiles. One basal artery in the amphibian and the avian. In human, a case with two basal arteries or the report is in the literature. This is simplified anatomical illustration. In fish and amphibians, right and left vascular system is separated. Shown here, reptiles and vars and mammals has the circle of willis. If you look at the blood flow, the blood flow is from the carotid artery to the basal artery. In fish, amphibian, reptiles, and birds, basal artery flow supplied by ICAs is cranial caudal. But mammals have newly formed basal artery, this yellow part, so there is caudal rostral flow only in mammals. Different species have different patterns of arterial supply to the brain. ICA mainly supply the brain, body arteries supply the brain, carotid red available supply to the brain. Ooh, no ICA and no VA. Uh, this species uh, brain is supplied by 
the red, thoracic red, spinal red mirabo. I believe any vertebrae have ICA at least one time during embryogenesis. Otherwise, they fail to form prosencephalon and may die in utero. It is interesting to know how they compensate ICA for During embryogenesis at week 5, the IC can be recognized. It supplies the forebrain and midbrain, via the olfactory artery and anterocolloidal artery and mesencephalic artery. The olfactory artery gives off the early ACA cranially and anterocolloidal artery cautery around the neck of the growing hemisphere. MCA appears as a lateral branch of the ACA. More cautery, the ICA and the primitive outer send the three branches that supply the hind brain via the longitudinal neural artery. These branches are named after the accompanying nerves and location trigeminal artery, hypogross artery, floatrantral artery. These transient anastomoses rapidly regress in about a week and the posterior communicator artery develops and the basal artery supplied from the vertebral artery finally. But in some cases, we encounter the remnant of the carotid basal anastomosis in usual clinical settings. They are called persistent carotid basal anastomosis, tri persistent trigeminal hypogrossal plurantral arteries. For example, this case shows a persistent trigeminal artery coming from the carotid artery, supplied basal artery, and bilateral SCA. As you can see in the right uh, photo, the hypogrossal artery from the carotid artery supplied the whole basal artery. The second topic is aortic arch development and anomalies of great vessels. Look at these two chest x ray Can you see the difference or tell the diagnosis? Chest X-ray interpretation is one of the fundamental skills of every physician, but many neurosurgeons tend to underestimate the X-ray, especially in emergent cases. The reason I present these two cases today is to remind all of you the importance of chest X-rays. In the left photo, you can see the aortic arch on the right side. And in the right photo, you can see the aortic arch and left ventricle in the right side. They have similar cases. This is right-sided aortic arch and this is visceral inversion. Let's see our case. C presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage, and 3D CT angiography showed a ruptured aneurysm at the bifurcation of anterior cerebral artery. So we decided to perform coil embolization. You can see the unusual findings. This is right subgravity artery, right CCA, left CC, and left subgravity artery. But she has right sided aortic guard. When we perform cerebral angiography without knowing right sided aortic arch, it's not easy to complete the study due to the difficulty of catheterization. I recommend you to remember this figure. I will explain how the aortic arch forms. This is a famous illustration of the aortic arch development. Bilateral ventral aorta, bilateral dorsal aorta, and six pairs of aortic arch. But first, second, fifth aortic arch regressed. Then, our other type of aortic arch forms shown in the right figure. The third aortic arch becomes ICA, and fourth, aortic arch becomes ascending aorta. 
This hypothetical double audio arch is also famous. And using this illustration, we can understand easily how the anomalies of the great vessels forms. This is Edward's hypothetical double audio arch. We have to pay attention to those who il to illustration is not real. They are only illustrations. If you want to know the real change of the Arctic Arch development, I recommend you to review this old paper published a hundred years ago. This figure shows a transformation of the Arctic Arch system during the development of human embryo. The point is, all six Arctic Arches don't exist simultaneously. This is the development of the Arctic system. First, first and second Arctic arch forms, but regressed. The fifth Arctic arch is do not form bilaterally or soon disappear. Development arches in the second month. The arteries from the first to third arches are symmetrical. But the arches from the fourth and sixth arches developed asymmetrically. Finally, this is the Arctic arch and great vessels at birth. Several anomalies of the Arctic arch and great vessels are reported. In the most common variation, you know, three vessels arise from the Arctic Arch. The brachiocephalic artery is the first vessel to arise from the Arctic Arch, followed by the left CCN and then the left subcranial artery. This normal configuration occurs in 70 to 80 percent of cases. 13 percent had a low common origin of the left CCA from a brachiocephalic trunk. 3 percent had four vessel pattern right brachiocephalic, right left CCA, left VA, and left subcranial artery. This means you know that left vertebral artery directly originate from the aortic arch. I will explain some cases with anomaly of the great vessels. First, avalanche right subcranial artery, ARSA. This is the most common anomaly associated with the left aortic arch. This anomaly is observed in approximately 1 to 2 percent. It occurs when the right fourth aortic arch and the right dorsal aorta cranial to the right seventh intersegment artery involute. Therefore, the seventh, aortic, a seventh intersegment artery crosses the midline like this usually posterior to the esophagus, forming an avalanche right subcranial artery. You can see the right subcranial artery was seen behind other great vessels in the right photo. Another aortic arch anomaly is a right-sided aortic arch. This anomaly occurs as a result of an interruption of dorsal segment of the left arch between the left subcranial artery and descending aorta. With regression of the right ductus aortiotus in Edward's hypothetical double aortic arch. This anomaly is observed in 13 to 35 percent of patients with tetraotigial follow and in approximately 8 percent of patients with transposition of the great vessels. I will present our case initially thought to be a case of right-sided aortic arch. As this is a 3D CTA, look at this part. What can you see? Here, this is not a right-sided aortic arch, but double aortic arch. You can see the ring. A double aortic arch is uncommon vascular anomaly that develops when there is no break in Edward's hypothetical double 
arch and both the fourth arches and dorsal outers persist. You can see this CD image that this anomaly can constrict the esophagus and trachea. A bovine arch. Many of you usually use these words. Left CC from brachiocephalic cartilage, we usually say bovine, it's a bovine arch, but this is misnomer. True bovine arch is like this. A bilateral subarachnoid artery from single brachiocephalic trunk. Uh, it's uh, also a bicarotid trunk. This is bovine, and this is the dog cat, and this is a, a pig. Next, I will discuss about the anterior perforating artery. Perforant arteries are divided into sections based on the artery of origin, you know, and discussed independently in the literature. But perforators penetrating the anterior perforated substance share its territory and variations. So I recommend you to discuss these perforating arteries as a embryological lateral straight artery group. This is uh, at the view from the base. Here is the anterior perforated substance. Anterior perforated substance is a rhomboid shaped area. Anterior border, posterior border, lateral border, and middle border like this. And here is a question. You can see the ventricular straight artery feeding to the AVM nidus. But why is the angle of LSC at the origin so steep here? These hairpin curves uh, can be seen uh, in the old literature about 100 years ago. This is lateral stratary means lentical stratary. The first vessel penetrates the telencephalon perpendicularly. The straight arteries penetrate the brain via the antiperforated substance and supply the basal ganglia and the internal capsule. Gradually, the area supplied by MCA becomes prominent when compared with the territory supplied by the straight artery. So because the site of penetration here and the perfusion area are constant, MCA comparatively stretch as the brain grows. This is why the lenticular straight artery is one retrograde. This is a schematic representation of the formation of the anterior cerebral artery, recurrent artery of Hoibana, and the middle cerebral artery. The terminal end of ICA branch constitutes a primitive olfactory artery, and multiple plexiform arterial twigs appear just distal to the anterior core artery and evolve into the embryological lateral straight arteries. This is lateral straight arteries. Then, large part of the basal ganglia and internal capsule is supplied by the prominent recurrent artery of Hoibner at 24 weeks of gestation. MC precursors also develop from embryological lateral straight arteries. This is adult configuration of cerebral arteries of anterior circulation. The basal ganglia and supply mainly by the recurrent artery of Hoibner, proximal medial straight artery, and the lenticular straight artery from the MCA trunk. First, embryologically, MCA is a branch of ACA. Second, embryologically, recurrent artery of Hoibner lenticular straight arteries and MCA have the same origin. They are 
of embryological lateral straight arteries. The current artery of Hoibner is first described by Hoibner in 1872. It has a single trunk or double trunk or triple trunk. Its origin varies in cases. And the uh, Hoibner artery also has the cortical branches to the frontal lobe. Hoibner artery supplies the parenchymal territory and uh, extracerebral, intracerebral anastomosis between perforators of recovered and artery Hoibner MCA about 10%. So recovered artery Hoibner and A1 perforator, AC cortical branch, uh, lenticular straight artery for MCA. They are all in the same in origin as I showed you before. So how about the origin of the lenticular straight arteries? There are many reports about variety of origins of lenticular straight artery, MCA, accessory MCA, A1, pecalent artery of Hoiver. Look at this uh, case. This case LSA from A1. LSAs can originate from any branch of the embryological lateral straight artery variant. I will show you some example. Next. This is A1, and this white arrow shows the lenticular straight artery from the A1. Like this. Ooh, how about this? This is right IC injection. This is A1 origin LSA and another LSA. How about this? Right IC injection. Uh, this is posterior view. LSA from A1 and LSA from M2. So this patient has no LSA from M1. This is a case with LSA from A2. This A2. So in the right figure, this is a microscopic view. And this is aneurysm and white art to show this LSA. But in the operative, you can easily misunderstand this artery is uh, one of the cortical branches to the frontal base, but this is LSA, so we should preserve this artery. How about this? It's a little bit complicated uh, anatomy. First, accessory MCA from A2. And this artery is a duplicate MCA from ICA. So this aneurysm occurs at the bifurcation uh, ICA duplicate MCA. This is accessory MCA. This is duplicate MCA. Then how about there is this is anterior artery. Recurrent artery of Hoibner. And this is accessory MCA. But in, in some cases, recurrent artery hoibna have cortical supply to the MCA. Look at these illustrations. Can you see the difference? Embryologically, an, an accessory MCA is the same as a hypertrophic recurrent artery hoibna with a cortical supply because they are embryological lateral straight arteries. So anterior perforant arteries, artery of Hoibner and the lenticular straight arteries are all perforated through the anterior perforated substance. And these uh, variations are all developed of embryological lateral straight arteries. So 3D rotational angiography or combium CT provides us useful anatomical information. Okay, last topic is the connection between the ophthalmic artery and MMA. 
This is one of so-called dangerous anastomosis between ICA and ECA. We must remember this knowledge to prevent any unfavorable outcome after neurosurgery or new intervention. In normal adults, the ophthalmic artery arises from the internal portion of the internal carotid artery and enters the orbit through the optic canal. The ophthalmic artery in the orbit is anatomically dividing into three parts. First, second, third. Therefore, embolization at points distal to the second part does not damage visual function. This is central retinal artery and other artery related to the optic apparatus. So we can see the three connections here. This is meningolacrimal artery run through the meningolacrimal foramen. This is recurrent meningitis artery through the SOF. Another artery is a deep recurrent ophthalmic artery through SOF. This is a case with MMA from the ophthalmic artery. The MMA derived from the ophthalmic artery here via the recurrent meningitis artery through the superopter fissure. This is MMA, this is ophthalmic artery. In this case, it's impossible to embolize MMA from the external carotid artery. This is ophthalmic artery from MMA. This is external carotid angiography. Ophthalmic artery and retinal brush. Uh, ophthalmic artery derived from the MMA via the recurrent meningitis artery. In this case, ophthalmic artery was not visualized by conventional internal carotid angiography. To inject liquid material from the proximal MMA has a risk of the occlusion of central retinal artery via the recurrent meningitis artery. We must pay attention from where we start inject liquid materials, especially in these cases. Uh, time was limited today, so if you are interested in functional neuroangiology, please refer to these two papers I reviewed last year. In summary, neuroangiology based on the embryology provides us many important clues to understand the pathogenesis of rare anatomical variations or disease. Knowledge of rare anatomical variants will help you to deal with patients properly when you encounter them even in emergency. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ota. You, you presented a uh, so fantastic presentation, including the uh, embryological uh, findings uh, regarding the, the circle of the virus and the aortic arch development, uh, anterior perforating arteries, and of course the uh, ophthalmic artery, middle meningeal artery, uh, focusing especially and dangerous anastomosis. Very informative uh, presentation for us and we, uh, vascular neurosurgeon, not only vascular neurosurgeon, of course interventionalists have to know about the vascular anatomy precisely. Very nice presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you. And uh, here there are about today we have uh, two discussant professor, uh, Professor Nupu and Professor yeah. Afu. Yeah. Do you have some comment to this presentation? Thank you. Yeah. Hi. So. Yeah. So, uh, Kimura. Uh, Thank you. Ex excellent talk. I just want to, uh, it was very uh, great learning for me personally. And I just want to ask you one question that what happens in where we where disease? We, uh, it's basically the, it's the, most of the patients have symptoms in middle cerebral artery disease. And we, we have a lot of collaterals from ophthalmic artery in these patients. If you know, when you do the IC injection, we get a lot of collaterals from the ophthalmic artery. And always and always in 
in my opinion, they always go to the ACA territory and never to the MCA territory. And I think that also can be explained very well by the embryological explanation that you have given nicely, so nicely. Your comments on this, uh, if you, I hope you understood the question. Thank you for a question. Uh, you mean the uh, collateral or circulation in Moya Moya disease? Yeah, yes, yes. From the ophthalmic artery, it always goes to the goes to the ACA territory. It almost mm -hmm. never goes to the MC territory. And I think that that explanation lies in your talk. And the Moya Moya disease, you know, is a, a genetic one of the genetic disease and the progressive. Yeah. Prosenk stenosis and occlusion of the ICA. But uh, today's topic is uh, one of the clues to understand you understand uh, the several disease. So Moya Moya disease is, uh, cannot be explained by the only embryological knowledge. Uh, it's uh, it also have a secondary or secondary effect of environment uh, around their vessels or genetic factors or some other cases, some other factors. So uh, now it's uh, difficult to answer to your question straightly. <laughs> it's just an observation. I'm just uh, saying because ophthalmic artery is more embryologically closer to anterior cerebral artery. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's why probably I, I thought that the, that is the reason why most of the collaterals from the ophthalmic artery when they come, they go to the ACA, A1, A, A1, A2 territory rather than going to the MC territory. That's all um, from my side. But uh, your comment is important in that uh, you, uh, we have to pay attention that uh, the anastomosis or connection between the ophthalmic artery and uh, inter intradural arteries are yeah. ex exist in yeah. uh, every cases it's very important yes yes thank you very much yeah, thank you for your question right professor astra thank you professor astra do you have yeah. some comment <laughs> yes Hi. thank you professor kimura yes a very nice talk and very useful for us i think this is uh, yes, something new for me too, even I'm uh, a vascular surgeon. I have to maybe comments, also maybe some uh, question according to you, your experience, Professor Ota. First, yes, uh, in my institution, even I am a vascular surgeon, uh, actually I'm not, you know, specifically uh, teaching this neuroanalogy to our resident, you know. Yeah, we just uh you know learn from cases you know, but I think uh embryology neuroanalogy is very important. Uh, I think for our resident, you know, we can you know teach them specifically. I think thank you your share to paper of yours yeah, uh, and and then I think I need your opinion about this. Also, the second is, I don't know in your experience, uh. Is there any you know moment that uh, even you uh, already carefully uh, you know uh, prepare for pre preoperative diagnostic in your vascular cases, and then after things uh, something happen, and then you realize that after that uh, you uh, learn again from the you know uh, radiology uh, diagnostic that you miss about this uh, according to this theory of embryology. So uh, please, uh, if you have experience about this. Thank you. Thank you for comments. And uh, yeah, I don't have uh, every or all knowledge about the neuroembryology. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, you, as you said, I always be learning, learning uh, every, uh, from the every case and forget. Yeah, yeah. Most of the knowledge and uh, and learn again, <laughs> so it's yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have to learn uh, for life. <laughs> Do you think? Yeah, so? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, many of many of the audience, I mean, uh, some of you are brain surgeon, brain neurosurgeon. I think so. 
for brain sur brain neurosurgeon the vascular anatomy embryological vascular anatomy is uh, important for example i present a case with uh, ophthalmic artery originate from the mma uh, in that case we cannot cut or coagulate the MMA, proximal mma because central retinal artery is occluded by that procedure so uh, if we use a tenon approach and uh, coagulate the dura mater, but uh, M MMA in that case should be observed. So some of the functional neuroanatomy, neurovascular anatomy is very important, even for brain neurosurgeon, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic <laughs> comment. Yeah. We have to pay attention to the ophthalmic artery preoperatively for all yeah, cases. Especially. Yeah, especially, yeah, especially. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, thank you. Is there any comment, question from the audience? Yes, if I may ask. Raja, please, thank you. Question. Uh, Professor Rota, first of all, let me uh, congratulate you for this wonderful lecture. I just wanted to ask you about the embryonic uh, uh, circulation that you showed. The lower ones, like pro atlantal type 1 and type 2. How can you differentiate the both on an angiogram? Because both are looking very similar. Are there any cues? Yeah, and the, the instance of the proatonatal type 1 or type 2, the type 2 is less. So I have no experience uh, with the case with the uh, high proatonatal artery type 2. So uh, when we have to this. Uh, differentiate the type two. Say so you look at the um, artery and the uh, the relationship the artery and the foramen magnum. The location of the passing through the artery, uh, the foramen magnum. So that's one of the key. So we we should take the anterior posterior view and lateral view of, of the DSA. Or 3D CTA uh, is also useful for for us to differentiate the type one and type two proatarate. So sometimes we see the extra dural pica. Is, yeah, is uh, it the same as uh, one of the primitive arteries? No, no. The ex pica is a, a very interesting artery. So. The pike, the reading of the pica varies from the intradural to extradural. So extradural pica is uh, uh, not related to the proantral artery, um, persistent to carotid basal arteries. Uh, today is, it's uh, have a limited time, so I cannot explain oh. fully to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Raja. Uh, any comment, question from the audience? Any other? Okay, so question from Dr. Sujan Sharif. Yes, Sujan. Sujan. Sujan is Bantane fellow now. And also uh, hello. Hello. hello uh, thank you, Otto Sensei, for your uh, nice uh, presentation regarding, uh, regarding some embryological background. It's uh, uh, new for us. Uh, we uh, forget all the embryologies. We are not learning embryology all the time. So my question is, uh, did you uh, face any difficulties uh, during DSA when you uh, find this type of uh, uh, vascular anomalies like uh, double aortic aneurysm or uh, recurrent uh, uh, artery of Hebner uh, anomalies? So is there any difficulties between, uh, during catheterization? Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. So I showed you a case with right-sided outed arch. Uh, yes. But in that case, 3D CTA uh, angiography of brain was performed, but neck or aortic arch CT angiography we did not perform. So we we performed cerebral angiography and we navigated a diagnostic catheter. But the catheter navigate 
right side to the vertebral body. So I pointed the young neurosurgeon. Is it vein? Is it uh, SVC or IVC? But uh, the catheter located in the outer. So at that time, we I finally found that this patient has a right-sided aortic arch. So if without that knowledge, probably I was not able to complete the cerebral angiography. Thank you, Sensei, for your explanation. Thank you. But Ben, do you have some comment? Yes, I have, I have a quick question. But uh, first of all, congratulations and uh, Professor Ota, this is a very wonderful, informative lectures to the young professors and very basic. And uh, hopefully if you have time, uh, the next time you can share about the posterior circulation as well. So uh, I, my, I have a question about uh, any tips uh, for the tumor embolization with the ophthalmic uh, artery and MMA uh, anastomosis. So uh, any tips during the procedure, how to um, uh, uh, preserve the ophthalmic uh, artery? And uh, also if uh, incidentally, uh, for example, if uh, the ophthal there are some uh, uh, embolic agent flowing to the um, ophthalmic artery via the anastomosis, usually, uh, uh, how how is the visual outcome of the patients if uh, there is uh, some accidental embolization of the uh, ophthalmic artery via this anastomosis? That is a good question, and uh, if we if we inject liquid material in the MMA, so we have to see the light, uh, lateral lateral view. Uh, of, is very important. And uh, as I show you today, recurrent meningeal artery or meningolacrimal artery is used for the anastomosis between the ophthalmic artery and MMA. But both foramen located at the level of the anterior cranial base. So mm. if you navigate through, uh, navigate above, far above the uh, anterior cranial base uh, microcatheter to the above the far above the anterior cranial base probably uh, you can inject liquid material safely but uh, mm -hmm. we have to pay attention to the back flow to the proximal mma yeah do, do yes. you understand okay yes. so so we have to check the location of the microcatheter related to the anterior cranial base or especially anterior cranioid from anterior cranioid process. I recommend you that. And uh, if we occlude the ophthalmic artery through the MMA, the probably the visual or defect or visual problem occurs, I think. But mm. luckily I have no case, no such case. Thank you. Thank you for, for, uh, thank you for, for your comment and answer. Very meaningful comment. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Professor Ota. Thank you for your wonderful informative lecture. We learned a lot so much. Thank you. So now uh, let's move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Nazim Ahmed, right? Okay. Are you from the intentional care unit? Care unit now. Okay, can you present? Okay, now today she will talk about the uh, the fluorescent dye assisted resection of high grade gliomas. Our experience in Ibrahim Cardiac Hospital and Research Institute. Are you ready? Yeah. Please do your presentation. Thank you. Thank you.
Please uh, share the screen. Uh, there yeah. is a share screen uh, function button at the yeah. Noah Noah um at uh, 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 can you hear me yes uh, we can hear you. and also please uh, uh, turn your powerpoint into presentation mode please yes, okay. yes. Okay. good afternoon from dhaka bangladesh and uh, before Presenting my topic, I am conveying my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Iko Kato and Dr. Liu Boon Singh for inviting me to this prestigious forum on the behalf of uh, young neurosurgeons of Bangladesh. So let's, uh, let's have a look uh, about the important landmarks in the history of glioma surgery first, because knowledge about the history paint a detailed picture of where we stand today. So before going for main presentation, I want to highlight some of the historical landmarks in glioma surgery. So uh, earliest evidence of glioma surgery date back to 19th century, where Sir Rudolf Varko first coined the term glioma. Since then, several path-breaking advancements happened, started from the classification then diagnostic advances, incorporation in neuro navigation and microscope system during the resection procedure. And furthermore, adjuvant therapy and molecular tumor profiling have improved the prognosing and survival nowadays. So where are we now? From 2000 to present, we are now uh, giving our attention to glioma biology and molecular targeted therapies and other experimental treatment strategies. So there are several ways to maximum safe surgical resection of glioma and among them, fluorescent dyes are one of the effective agent for maximum safe surgical resection. So uh, here I am, Dr. Najin Nahumad, uh, going to present fluorescent dye assisted resection of high grade gliomas our experience in Ibrahim Cardiac Hospital and Research Institute. So this is my working place where I am working as a registered and specialist for last two and a half years. So in my study, the importance of complete surgical dissection for hybrid glioma has been highlighted in the scientific literature in order to limit tumor recurrence and improve progression-free survival. So several fluorescent biomarkers have been tested to improve interoperative identification of tumor, among which fluorescent sodium is now starting to play a central role in glioma surgery, especially in a resource-limited country like us, Bangladesh. So how fluorescent sodium acts, uh, let's have a recapitulation first. The fluorescent sodium is a fluorescent substance which should become excited by the light whose, whose wavelength is in uh, between 460 to 500 nanomicron emits fluorescent radiation. So it does not selectively accumulate in astrocytoma cell like a 5 ala, but in extracellular tumor sites, suggesting its role as a marker for compromised blood-brain barrier areas in high-grade glioma. So it's very effective to uh, resect the WHO grade 3 and grade 4 gliomas because those tumors uh, distort the blood-brain barrier. So in our setup, we give fluorescent sodium about six milligram per kg body weight, which we have injected about 45 minutes before the dural opening through the central venous line. And it is observable under the yellow 560 nanomicron surgical microscope filter, allowing a better tissue discrimination. So in the left one, it's, uh, if you look at the paraoperative picture, it's almost impossible to distinguish the neoplastic uh, tissues but in the right one if we uh, if we look there is a brilliantly fluorescent enhanced 
scattered areas. So in this study, uh, I will report our preliminary data retrospectively collected on 20 patients operated for high glare glioma in our setup. And our aim is to demonstrate the effectiveness and safety of fluorosis guided maximum safe surgical resection in high grade glioma surgery. So these are the materials and methods. And uh, we have introduced 20 consecutive uh, patients with high grade glioma. We operated between 2020 to 2023. And there are 12 males and six females. The age ranges between 30 to 73 years. So the procedure, basic procedure I have already mentioned earlier. And, and the result demonstrated that we have achieved gross total resection in 60% of our cases and 95% and subtotal resection in 5%, that is one cases. And there was no postoperative new onset of seizure except one case and existing neurological deficit become transiently aggravated in eight cases. Later on it, it become resolved. However, no adverse effect correlated to fluorescence had been recorded so far. So now I'm going to represent uh, some of the representative cases in our setup. Our first case, that is a 38 years old, normotensive, non-diabetic lady presented with the features of occasional moderate to severe headache for two months and changes in her personality and behavior for the same duration. She was neurologically intact, except the motor power was four out of five. So this is the MRI of the brain, which contrast multiple axial sections, one weighted image. It uh, uh, demonstrated that there is a fairly large, well-defined isoto hypointense lesion located in the right temporal lobe, having a centrally placed hyperintense area, causing significant mass effect, uh, which is evident by gross midline shifting, compression of the cerebral peduncle, as well as compression and displacement of the ventricular system towards the right. So in the T2 weighted image, the lesion become heterogeneously hyper intense and there is a flow void of MC at the medial aspect of the tumor. In the coronal section, there is significant displacement of the M1, M2 and M3 segments of the right MCA in upward direction. So after administration of the contrast, there is mild heterogeneous contrast enhancement by the lesion and has very minimum vasogenic edema in the flare sequence. So this is some of the paroperative pictures, our craniotomy. Uh, we went for a frontotemporoparietal craniotomy for these cases, just short video clip. So we are incorporating the neuro navigation system. We are uh, indeed a craniotomy, cysturotomy, the white light microscopic appearance of the tumor, and after application of the fluorescent filter, uh, this is the fluorescent enhanced areas. And with the help of PUSA, we are proceeding for removal of the tumor. the intraoperative uh, tractography. So reception is going on. So in this case, we have achieved gross total resection of the tumor and after completion of the procedure, uh, we achieved hemostasis with fibrillar. So closing. And histopathology gains WHO grade four glioma, but uh, it's glioblastoma. So from the imaging, we have suspected that it's maybe a, a case of grade two or grade three glioma, considering the contrast enhancement pattern, but came grade four. This is a post-operative CT scan uh, showing some reactionary mm -hmm. hemorrhagic changes. So this is our patient. Mm -hmm. 22 days after operation in mm -hmm. her home, she is doing fine. And patient received uh, concurrent chemo radiation and this is the MRI of brain with MRS, which we did 20 months after the resection, which uh, shows that there is uh, MRI, MRS features is consistent with uh, features of pseudo progression rather than recurrence. So our next case, this is a kind of uh, unusual presentation. This 67 years old male patient where we presented uh, with us the features of cerebellar dysfunction for one month. So uh, he was evaluated at outside our facilities first. So 
And let's have a look at his MRI. There is a ISO2 hypointense well circumscribed lesion occupying the right cerebellar hemisphere, surrounded by uh, areas of uh, hypointensity, and there is compression of the fourth ventricle as well as cerebellar hemisphere. So this lesion become brilliantly hyperintense in the T2 weighted sequence, uh, which is surrounded by hypointense wow. rim, and there is evidence of some vasogenic edema. So after administration of the contrast, there is irregular rim enhancement. So surrounded by some kind of vasogenic edema in the PWI and ADC, there is no uh, restriction of diffusion. So uh, from this imaging, already patients have gone for uh, antituvercular chemotherapy prophylactically outside our facilities. But uh, after seven days, he developed features of hepatitis and uh, stopped the medication. And um, when he came to our facilities, uh, his uh, basic complaint was progressive deterioration of the consciousness level for four days. So we did an urgent CT scan of brain which demonstrated that there is significant enlargement of the lesion with uh, significant mass effect and patient already developed obstructive hydrocephalus. So what we did, we did right-sided suboccipital craniotomy and gross total removal of the tumor and placement of AVD through right frazier spine at the same sitting. So this is the um, 3D reconstruction showing the placement of AVD as well as the size of the craniotomy. This is a paraoperative video. We expected that we, we may get some of the necrotic part as because there is rim enhancement, but to our utmost surprise, it was a solid tumor. See, it's a solid lesion, kind of rubbery um, and uh, part of it is firm in consistency. So in, the, in this case, we achieved near total resection. And this is the immediate postoperative CT scan showing kind of reactionary hemorrhagic changes, but there is almost no tumor. So it's a postoperative, immediate postoperative follow up. The follow up status is uh, histopathology WHO grade four, and patient is uh, on adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. So far, he is doing fine. So our next is 66 years old lady. It's a known case of DM hypertension, CKD presented with the complaints of changes in the personality and behavior for 15 days and weakness of the right upper and lower limb for the same duration. So she is uh, neurologically intact except muscle power is three out of five in the right upper and lower limb. So this is the MRI T1 weighted image, T2 weighted image and flare, which shows that is that there is a Ill defined ISO2 hypointense lesion located in the left frontal lobe and That's having massive awesome. awesome. evidence by compression and displacement of the corpus callosum and ventricular system towards the right side. And the T2 weighted image become heterogeneously hyperintense, but no, there is no significant flow void seen in the margin or uh, within the lesion. And the flare image shows there is moderate vasogenic edema. So after administration of the contrast, there is a heterogeneous rim enhancement by the lesion. So this is the paraoperative appearance. Uh, if we compare the appearance to my previous patient, there is a homogeneous uh, uh, fluorescent enhancement by the lesion. And uh, paraoperatively, we uh, got a very well-defined cleavage plane and uh, we achieved near total removal because some part of the tumor which become attached with this pain uh, left behind. So we achieved near total resection. So this patient is now on uh, adjuvant chemo radiation ongoing, and the histopathology report is consistent with great wow. So our last case, this is a 41-year-old male, it's a known case of hypertension, presented with the features of occasional moderate to severe headache for two months and weakness of the right side of the body for the same duration, uh, almost similar feature to the third case, and he, he has motor power of four out of five in the right side. So this is a huge tumor, which we have operated in 2022. So, huge contrast, heterogeneously contrast enhancing lesion occupying the left frontal lobe. This is the sagittal section, coronal section showing the similar findings with 
mild features of subpox and herniation. So in this case, we achieved gross total resection uh, with the help of fluorescein and histopathology consistent with grade four and patient completed adjuvant chemoradiation and no radiation induced morbidity during his treatment. So this is the MRI of uh, brain with MRS, which we did in September 2023. So the voxel from this selection is consistent with kind of recurrence. So uh, now we should, uh, let's have a look about the literature review. So several journals have already explained and there are so many studies about this fluorescent induced resection of high grade glioma. And if we sum up the uh, results of this review, we show that there is minimum side effect. It's a uh, fluorescent agent is cheap, easily available, and it's already documented that the helpful adjunct for maximum resection of hybrid glioma, which have a positive role in progression free survival as well as overall survival of this patient. So, uh, what are the learning points from my presentation as a young neurosurgeon? Each and every agent has some pearls and big pearls. So if we look at the surgical pearls, so you have seen that more homogeneous enhancement interoperatively seen, which aids maximum safe surgical resection if we compare it uh, with uh, five ALA. So no adverse effects so far recorded except anaphylactic reaction in one study. Uh, in our 20 cases, we didn't notice any anaphylactic reaction. The patient should be counseled regarding the yellow discoloration of the urine in 24 to 40 hours postoperative. So, and uh, last but not the least, uh, says uh, the fluorescent agent is almost 91 to 94 percent sensitive and specific for high grade glioma in different studies. And the pitfall is uh, sometimes this fluorescent agent have uh, some false positive and false negative impression paraoperatively. So what we did during resection, if we look at the mechanism of fluorescent sodium, uh, we have already known that it uh, acts, uh, it accumulates in the compromised blood brain barrier. So during resection, there is iatrogenic disruption of the blood-brain barrier system. So there is false enhancement of the fluorescein uh, for which uh, wow. any young neurosurgeon can be misguided. Uh, so uh, we did, we placed cotonoids uh, during resection and uh, the cleavage plane, uh, we put cotonoids to demarcate the border. Uh, for, uh, by following this, we, we have already upgraded the, these pitfalls. So the main limitation of this uh, study is uh, our center is a very much new center and we have started uh, neurosurgery here for four years only. So uh, the sample size is uh, limited here and larger scale studies are now needed to quantify the efficacy of fluorescent guided surgery in improving the extent of resection as well as progression for survival and overall survival of the patient. So my take home message uh, for especially the young neurosurgeons. Then, so now we are in the uh, 2023 and we continue to seek to understand tumor biology and to invent and improve methods of cure. So in this journey, fluorescent based glioma surgery can be a promising technology in achieving gross total resection and distinguishing tumor margin from the normal brain tissue with a new hope of supratelar resection in future especially in a resource-limited country like Bangladesh. So thank you very much, uh, audience, for your patient sharing. And again, thank you for inviting me in this prestigious forum. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nazim from the international... Inter, inter, I see, from the IC, sorry. Yeah, and I, a fantastic presentation. I just want your first congratulations on your excellent work report from the cons 20 consecutive cases operate uh, using a fluorescent guided uh, high grade glioma surgery. Fantastic yeah. surgery. Yeah, exactly. Uh, very, very uh, informative for us to use uh, fluorescent. Yeah. So I just want to ask you a, a short comment. So, did you, uh, in that uh, in your institute, 
the outcome of, of the glial massagery is improved after the intro, introduce, introduction of the fluorescent guided surgery. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for your uh, nice question. Uh, during my presentation, I have already uh, told that uh, though I am working uh, in the uh, facilities uh, of the largest private sector in Bangladesh, but in these facilities, we have uh, started our uh, department of neurosurgery only for four years, that is in 2019. Mm, then after uh, we have passed a COVID era, which have a significant negative impact during our patient admission. So considering all these factors, I think this is a pretty good number uh, if we consider the, uh, the new department and uh, COVID era. I think um, 20 uh, is not so it's a good number for uh, high-grade gliomas. Mm. We're waiting for the. So, uh, sir, uh, you asked me about the comparison. Yeah, uh, it's possible in future, I hope, because um, if we want to compare it or uh, compare the resection, for every case, we have used fluorescent dyes. So, uh, till now, we have uh, no uh, control group for uh, like white light resection. Uh, my uh, white light microscopic resection, I mean. So um, it's very difficult to compare uh, whether um, if uh, when I uh, keep the follow-up, there is a diverse uh, outcome. Like uh, one cases we have achieved gross rotor resection, it's radiologically proved, but uh, patient expired four months after the resection. Uh, already in my presentation, I I, um, I have shown two cases. They are very fine even after two years of resection. Uh, so uh, the results are uh, not enough. Till now, it's not enough to uh, for an for an conclusion, conclusive remarks. Thank you, thank you. Okay. I'm waiting for your forward data. Uh, yeah. Thank, uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Asura, do you have some comment? Uh, Professor, thank you. Oh, yes, yes, sure. Thank you, Dr. Nathan, for your presentation. I just want to ask you one question. Uh, yes, there are many you know, modalities for shift surgery. Uh, yes, there are many modalities for shift surgery in glioma. You know? yeah. uh, yes, you use fluorescent. Uh, do you sometimes uh, use uh, a weak surgery? For some cases, uh, they are related to the, some area of the brain. Thank you, please. Um, thank you very much for your question. No, we didn't, uh, till now, we didn't uh, go for any awake surgery because it needs special setup and specially trained population. As we have already mentioned, that our department is uh, very much new in this regard, it has only for four years. Uh, I hope in near future, we'll uh, definitely go for that. Yes, yes, thank you. Because, you know, uh, if you're dealing with glioma in some related uh, area of the brain, yeah. for some cases, I think uh, uh, weak surgery is very helpful. Okay, thank you, yeah. Nasmin. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good comment. I totally agree with the comment. Yeah, in the future, the weak surgery should perform. Thank you, thank you. We hope so. Uh, I hope so. Thank you. Any other comment from the audience? Thank you. Oh, pr Professor... Professor Nupu. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. If you have hi, some comments, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank Dr. You. Dr. Nasmin. Dr. Nasmin. Yes, sir. Dr. Nasmin, very, very nice talk. And I just want you, uh, just for sake of completion for our younger participants, we just summarize the differences between 5LA and fluorescein. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, definitely I agree that it is a very good and very effective and a cheap alternative uh, fluorescein and can be used more widely as compared to quick. If you could quickly summarize for us the differences and relative advantages disadvantages. Okay, uh, sir, in case of 5LR, sir, yeah, it's more specific for tumor cell because this agent is uptaken by the tumor cell and selectively enhance only the neoplastic. So definitely... Uh, if we consider the mechanism of these agents, the 5 ala is more specific, more specific. Whereas uh, fluorescent sodium is a passive agent, rather I should say, because it accumulates in the compromised blood-brain barrier. It, it has no role to enhance the neoplastic tissues. And uh, the compromised blood-brain barrier properties, uh, we have uh, 
so that's why uh, i have already um, shown in my presentation i have already told that there are some false positive and false negative impression during fluorescent assisted resection uh, intraoperatively so uh, we have taken precautions and in case of five vela this false positive and false negative result is much uh, more minimum very minimum but in case of fluorescent aided resection this false positive false negative result can bias any surgeon any surgeon especially young neurosurgeon like me uh, we can get easily easily biased and the second point is five vela is a uh, now sub comparing to five vela fluorescent is a relatively cheap agent only uh, considering my currency it's only uh, 1 dollar in one ampoule 1 dollar but uh, what about the light what what, what about the specific specific yeah you need just a yellow light uh, for this but for i think five vela you need uh, uh, a, a more uh, special microscope right yeah uh, uh, definitely for fluorescent uh, definitely uh, in case of fluorescent the advantage is we can uh, we can uh, observe it in uh, without uh, microscope also the dose is relatively high that is 20 mg per kg body weight we if we give 20 mg per kg body weight it is really visible in naked eye naked eye so uh, if we uh, use a relatively low dose that is 2 to 8 mg per kg body weight that uh, in that cases we need fluorescent filter in uh, microscope to visualize the fluorescent enhanced areas thank you that was really useful thank you yeah, thank you. yeah. Uh, Dr. Joel, you have some comment, question? Yeah, thank you, uh, Prof. Kimura. Yeah, Sam from uh, Malaysia. Hi, Dr. Nasmin. Uh, excellent uh, talk. I think uh, I've learned a lot from your presentation. Uh, let me ask two questions. Um, bit number one, uh, would you suggest an optimal time frame in which you give and how long after you would say that uh, this fluorescein most likely is staining only tumour and after that, amount of time uh, it would maybe even stain uh, normal cells and uh, give a false uh, 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 positive uh, from the staining uh, that's the first question and uh, the next question would uh, do you do the surgery under uh, the filter and uh, yellow light or do you just resect as much as you can uh, visible tumor then only you go to your fluorescein guided resection thanks okay Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I have already shown that uh, we uh, give uh, we use six milligram per kg body weight uh, dose, and we introduced uh, through it central venous venous catheter after diluting it with 100, uh, 100 ml normal saline. So uh, through CV line we have introduced it. Uh, this is the approximate time we have uh, calculated so one uh, forty five minutes to one hour before dural opening. So it's a uh, time maybe, there may be a slight variation of the timing, but approximately 45 to one hour, it's a timing. And uh, we use fluorescent filter during the section. So I don't know a naked eye resection until uh, now. So after application of the fluorescent filter during resection, uh, if we uh, again recapitulate the mechanism of action of fluorescent, it accumulates in the area of the compromised blood blood brain barrier. So during this section, we are using our sucker, our uh, cruiser. So uh, uh, during resection procedure, some of the healthy neurons and blood brain barrier become easily affected. So those areas can be uh, false positive, uh, false positive impression during resection. So uh, what we did, we did, we placed the cottonoids uh, in the uh, resection margin. Uh, when we get an impression that we have completed in this pool, like uh, right, left, superior, inferior, and base of the tumor. So after the, when we reach the margin, we place cotonoids to uh, make a boundary, right. make a boundary. So beneath the cotonoids, though the area becomes frozen and enhanced, we don't go for resection because mm -hmm. definitely in that time, it gives a false positive uh, result. Okay, that's useful. And, uh, and uh, if we compare our study with uh, previously published articles, 
So there are some uh, disadvantages of dosen that is, uh, I have already told, the one study report the anaphylactic reaction in one cases, but still uh, in 20 of our cases, we didn't notice any anaphylactic reaction. We uh, took some precaution that is, uh, we meticulously took any uh, history against uh, any allergic history against any drug before operation. Now, it may be a, a patient may be allergic against the drugs on or some kind of other drugs. But if the allergic history positive, our anesthetist already uh, used injection hydrocortisone and injection abil uh, before uh, just after induction of the anesthesia. If allergic history is present. And uh, they already, they meticulously monitored blood sugar level, blood pressure level, and uh, they uh, gave their utmost, um, they have tried to minimize uh, the, uh, any kind of adverse effect related to fluorescence. And uh, we observed uh, post-operative seizure in one of our case. So as uh, out of 20 cases, we have only observed seizure in one cases, whether it is related to fluorosin not or not, the uh, conclusion is uh, difficult. So, so more cases are needed actually to document any adverse reaction. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the answer. Thank you, thank you for your comment and thank you, good answer, Dr. Nazin and Joel. And uh, okay, now I just want to, Okay. Please. You shot. You raise your hands. Hi. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, it's it's thank you. Nice to meet you all, friends. Uh, uh, so my question was about actually the use of uh, five ALA and uh, comparison between the fluorescent uh, sodium, but the question was already answered by previous. Uh, our colleagues. So, so uh, I think the, the basic advantage is that uh, sodium fluorescein is cheap and easy to use and uh, fast, uh, ex, uh, despite its uh, false uh, positive effects, since uh, it's effective, uh, we can use it, to my understanding. Is that right? Sir, uh, actually, thank you for your question. Yes, uh, theoretically, anyone can say that that 5 LA is uh, specific for tumor cell, whereas I am using a passive agent. Uh, so uh, as a developing country like us uh, in Bangladesh, so Bangladesh is a resource-limited country, resource-limited country. Uh, so in that case, uh, 5 LA is a very expensive agent uh, for our patient. Uh, so, uh, here, actually, considering the overall situation, uh, we considered the fruits and sodium. It's a good alternative, though uh, some kind of false positive result, false negative result, but it's cheap, easily available. Uh, that's why we are uh, go going for it. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Prizad, do you have some comment? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Salam alaikum. Uh, Dr. Nazmin Ahmed. Uh, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, just I'd like to say uh, congratulations and we are proud of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. Any other comment, Professor Kato? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nazim. Again, congratulations on your excellent uh, work and presentation. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Nazmin. It was an excellent talk. Maybe in, a, in the future, I think you, you should come to Japan. And just uh, Dr. Dizshot, he learned a lot about the glioma at Nawa University. Maybe you can, uh, even a short visit, uh, you may expose to learn uh, our exercise. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you, thank you ma'am, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, for well, your great chance to visit the Japanese. Yeah, no yeah, way. yeah. Contact Kato. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sure. Definitely, I will contact. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I just want to move on to the next uh, presentation, and the next speaker is a professor, Adu Buraf Keres, right? Okay. 
Yes. He will talk about the history of microvascular laboratory practice and the Vascaya microvascular bypass training curriculum. Okay, please start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So first of all, thank you for the open session. Thank you, Dr. Professor Kato and Dr. Kuti and all organized committee. Uh, my name is Apla. I'm currently working at uh, University of Wisconsin Medicine, uh, Department of Neurology Surgery as a scientist. Today, I will briefly mention about historical uh, history of microvascular laboratory practice and our curriculum uh, that we have in our lab. First of all, I don't have any conflict of interest. This is our lovely medicine. Other than too cold in the winters, it's it's beautiful. We we welcome everyone here. Very briefly about my background, I'm I'm a MD medical doctor. I did not start any neurosurgery training, but I spent last six years in two different neurosurgery department. So an half year at Yeditepe University with yeah. Professor Ture and and. Over, yeah. over four we, four years in University of Wisconsin Medicine with Professor uh, Bashkaya. I start my laboratory training here at UW Medicine when I was in med school. I visited Dr. Bashkaya's laboratory for a couple months in 2012 and 2013. In 2013, I had a chance to to start work with microscopes and do some practice, and then when I finished my medical school in Turkey. I did uh, work with Professor Turet for two and a half years and spent some time in his lab and also observed their courses and attend their courses that they have there. And then returned back to medicine in 2019 and continue my work with uh, Professor Bashkaya. Since last two and a half years, I'm his lab manager. I. I would like to very briefly mention about two cases, actually two problems that we changed the whole field of like uh, vascular surgery. The first one is Saadi Karnat's case. So Saadi Karnat was like France uh, president and he was assassinated with this knife on, on the abdomen. And there was like main uh, venous injury, which uh, surgeons that time were not able to suture the veins and they, they, they lost their president because of that. There was a one med student in Lyon, France, that witnessed that that situation, and and he come up with a solution how to uh, suture vessels. He he come up with a like triangulation techniques and publish it uh, when he was met in medical school. Then he moved to United States and did a lot of different works and get the first Nobel Prize in medicine in uh, United States in 1912. So there was a problem. They were not able to suture micro, uh, microscopic suture the vessels. Alexis Karel find a solution and 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 work on it and find a solution, and became a well known person uh, for using microscope in the surgery that like uh, initiate the microsurgery. We should mention about like at least couple couple names and we should know about those to understand better the historical background. The first one is Nyland Switzerland, a T surgeon, as you can see here. He was the first person that using a microscope in, in modern surgery. So that was his drawing for the microscope. It was monocular microscope attached to a retractor that he used for ENT surgeries. And the second uh, person that his colleague Holmgren, ENT surgeon, uh, he 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 was also using the uh, different kind of microscopes and like whole brain started to use binocular microscopes and he got a drill uh, stand and attach a binocular microscope as you can see here and start using in in his uh, autosclerosis cases. Also, another anti surgeon Wulstein from Germany Wurzburg. He started to use microscope in surgery until 53. He he performed thousand cases with the microscope. So the first uh, surgeons were using the microscope were mostly ENTs and ophthalmic surgeons because of the avascular structures in their field. So they were not like uh, having problem with the bleeding. 
So after those, like uh, we should know a couple other names, especially like William House and his stepbrother of uh, Howard House, and they are also uh, ENT surgeons from United States. Howard House uh, get known to Dr. Wolfstein in Germany and visited his uh, clinics for a short time, and he saw that Dr. Wolfstein is using a microscope, operating microscope. He purchased one microscope, brought it to United States, and also invited Dr. Wolfstein to United States. That was the first operating microscope in the United States, and Dr. Wolfstein, they, they gave courses in a uh, house clinic, and then they, they start using those microscopes. And William e. House, stepbrother of uh, Hobart House, he also used microscope. And that time they didn't have a lab, and he, he started practicing the morgue with autopsy e. specimens. And by then, like Dr. Kurz, a nurse surgeon in the same e. center, he started to use for microsurgical procedures, Jacobson Suarez and, and Donaghy in a different place, Burlington, Vermont. They, they also start practice uh, with microscopes, uh, which like Jacobson is well known person as a like a vascular neurosurgeon. We should mention about like Jacobson a little bit more because he's really the pioneer of microvascular surgery. So uh, during that time, like the, the problem was not the uh, inability of the hand to perform. The problem was the inability of the eye to guide the performing hand. Therefore, they need something to magnify the, the visual, like the, the operating field. They tried magnifying glasses or color loops or other uh, magnifying magnification tools, but they were not uh, successful for such microvascular procedures. And uh, they, they came up with the, uh, that result, like below three millimeter, they need like 25 to 40 times magnification, which only operating microscope can provide and this is the second case that I, as i said like i'm going to talk about two cases that change whole the field and this is the case that we Gil had in, in zurich akasenic a cardiac surgeon in zurich he operated on a 17 years old uh, girl open cardiac surgery after the surgery patient had a uh, right side hemi syndrome and he took the patient to Professor Eshagil and he uh, he did a angiography and saw that like left hand sucus artery was uh, uh, blocked. And Akasenik asked him to uh, ask Professor Eshagil to okay go ahead and open the like the brain and uh, remove that embolu. But that time there was not there was no uh, available techniques for such uh, small vessel surgeries. And that initiate like that's that's another problem that uh, Professor Shagin and his chairman, uh, Dr. Kramberg, start looking for a solution, and it ended up with Donaghy's uh, laboratory in Burlington, Vermont. Professor Shagin spent like uh, after forty years old, he spent fourteen months in Donaghy's lab and mainly perform vascular and somos duplications, vein grafts, arterial grafts, synthetic grafts, and patches. In, in his lab and uh, that that time like they were using like first like some other materials they used uh, rats and they used also uh, mongrel dogs and then after that uh, time he, he Professor Shagil went back to Zurich and initiated microvascular uh, microneurosurgery in Zurich and he he operated uh, successfully complete first STMC aneurysm in a patient in 67. As you can see here at the beginning, like before that uh, lab training, protege lab training, they had a microscope in their uh, clinic in Zurich, but they didn't have a laboratory, they didn't have the training opportunity. After that training in Donaghy's lab, make, make him comfortable to apply those techniques that we call like microsurgical techniques to all field of neurosurgery. He, he did the same. He, he used the same techniques for every kind of pathology that he has, like AVMs, aneurysm, tumors, and, and vascular cases, other vascular cases. Here, this is like the one of the main uh, teacher of Yeshag is Jackie Roberts. He as he called during during his time, Yeshag's time in Donaghy's lab, 
he said like Professor Donaghy introduced like couple uh, operations uh, with him. Then then the rest was belonged to uh, Jackie Roberts, and she she helped him and teach him a lot. Therefore, like he called Jackie Roberts as a my main teacher in microtechnics. So she was a, a Dr. Donaghy's scrub nurse, even though she she's a nurse, she teach a lot of people microtechnics and. Uh, once uh, even people called her f mother of microsurgery. And the, the second person that I would like to mention about the Rosemary Freak. So when Professor Shagli went back to Zurich, he started courses there. And then after like uh, 79, Dr. Uh, uh, Rosemary Freak, another nurse, she took over the course and started to teach microtechnics uh, to nurse surgeon visiting uh, Zurich. And start the courses, uh, continue the courses all over the world. So far, she trained over three thousand uh, nurse surgeons all over the world. She traveled the world and then organized the course in different uh, institutions. And as you can see, she's another nurse and and uh, teaching microsurgical techniques to nurse surgeons. So the question is that do we still need microvascular surgery training? Yes, because of a couple different pathologies or uh, indications, still we need such uh, training, such surgeries, microvascular surgery in neurosurgery. Those are like the, the main uh, fields that we use those techniques, flow augmentation, flow replacement of prophylactic, prophylactic protective uh, surgeries. We still use microvascular surgery in neurosurgery. But as I said before, even though like we will never perform such surgeries, still we need such microvascular training, laboratory training in the, in the laboratories to enable us to perform delicate surgeries and improve our hand uh, skills, hand-eye coordination and microsurgical skills. And as Professor Eshagi says, like, like we need to have like uh, systematic level training and qualifying examination for professional competence that we uh, need for our daily daily practice, and as you can see here, like it is a really good drawing from uh, Dr. Uh, Shin Sheng, and we need to train our brain, brain, eye, and finger eyes, and and uh, their organizations together. There, and also like like as Professor Danagi said, a first experience has no place in operating room. We should go to the lab and try to do simulated surgeries before before we do our first in surgery in the patients and like as he suggests like microsurgeon has spent endless hours in practice in laboratories also professor Yashagi he stand uh, he advised for for a long time laboratory training in surgical neuroanatomy and microsurgical techniques there are different like subcategories that we can call like surgical, like like normal neuroanatomy, surgical neuroanatomy, pathologic anatomy, and for microsurgical techniques, microvascular techniques, just one uh, subheading in, in that field. So to be able to uh, train the people, they, they start to organize courses in Burlington, Vermont in 65, and the first one that uh, they organized when Professor Shagir was there. And and the other one is the first microsurgical uh, level training actually happened in Zurich uh, when Professor Shagir returned back to Zurich. They organized a course in 68 with 10 sized microscopes and and some jewelry for so Even that time, they didn't have very specific instruments designed for microsurgery such background gives us lots of clue that how we can do such practice even today, looking back uh, to those pioneers. And then in Yetep University, when I was there, we had like uh, Yashagil, Istanbul Yashagil microsurgery courses. I, I joined a couple of them, attended a couple of them and complete them successfully. Madame Freak, Rosemary Freak also comes to uh, Istanbul and organized microvascular courses there. In here, in UW Medicine, we have also very similar courses here. Other than those courses, we have uh, Dr. Bashkaya's uh, microvascular bypass training curriculum that he started when he got the position in, in the department in 2006. 
And so far, it changed. Uh, we have we have different version of it, but the main uh, practice is uh, almost the same. We have multiple sections in that curriculum, and we start with Penrose drain and uh, six o and seven o sutures. We incise the six centimeter length per, on Penrose drain and close it a continuous fashion with six o first five attempts. Then move on to seven o another five attempts. The first section like simulate the carotid and arterial telectomy closure. But because of the material, it's not the same like vascular uh, structures. We have different things to consider. And also it's it's good to uh, initiate such practice with the 70 and 60 and Penrose drain and like uh, improve your hand-eye coordination under microscopic magnification. It helps a lot, even like if no one, like if the trainee did not use microscope and because here we use lower magnification and they 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 are easily adapt that magnification rather than like going and uh, jumping on the small vessel and performing uh, practice. On the section two, we perform two different anastomosis sites with uh, nine O sutures. We have 12 attempts uh, with uh, silicone tubes. Uh, we have three millimeter silicone tubes two millimeter silicone tubes, we perform three and two and anastomosis with three millimeter tubes, then move on to two millimeter tubes, another three and two and anastomosis, then using two millimeter tube as a recipient and a donor and three millimeter as a recipient, we perform three and side anastomosis. And lastly, we using two three millimeter silicone tubes, we perform three Side to side anastomosis. After the, those first uh, anastomosis practice, we move on to chicken vessels and perform same anastomosis with 10 all sutures, three and turn, three and side, and three side to side anastomosis. The chicken vessels are the, the best materials that we can find and easily available uh, everywhere and very cheap. And it's a biologic material. There are lots of different artificial materials that cost much more uh, but it's it's always better to use chicken vessels before chicken vessels we use silicone tubes because the, there are like some some uh, good way to use it uh, you don't have to deal with like closed lumens with such artificial uh, materials but after some practice we should we should move on to chicken and and perform the rest of the practice with the chicken vessels if we need to do more and the last section we have red uh, surgery in our lab we perform red surgeries and each fellows that uh, comes to our lab complete the first three section and we perform the red surgery together i prepare the reds and they perform at least one successful anastomosis anthocyte uh, or uh, anthocyte anastomosis on a living rat. So day by day, we, we define like what uh, each trainee should done. So it, in the first four days, we just read and watch some some uh, videos, training videos. We start from Professor Shaggy's uh, early books from 69. Uh, they, they read a couple chapters from that book to see how he did it at the beginning, and then Dr. Aklan's uh, practitioners they read whole book on the second day. Then we we gave them Dr. Aklan's training videos, even uh, it's available on the YouTube, and also they watch couple cases, uh, bypass cases, Dr. Bashka's bypass cases in our archive, uh, and on day four I share my training videos specifically the design performed for the our curriculum. They reviewed each section first, uh, both the curriculum and assessment, and they, they start their practice. Day by day, they move to section two, then watching videos for curriculum and assessment, complete the trainings, and move on to section three. So it's at least like 17 days three to four hours practice each day, not too too long uh, and be less than 17 days because like we need to get those skills improved by time. If you do it in a rush, that's, that doesn't mean a lot for, for such practice. So 
we came up with a self uh, objective self assessment tool specifically designed for our curriculum for each section we have different kind of metrics uh, that we should be careful and assess like uh, our results by own so after each attempt each trainees watch my videos and they they can assess their panorous drain uh, continuous nutrient quality and like anastomosis with the silicone tubes and uh, chicken vessels so it's very it's straightforward objective answers self-made uh, so hopefully we will get it published soon so first section we have panorous drain we have six or seven or sutures forceps needle holder or uh, scissors the main uh, Matches that we use here, as you can see, first attempt here, and by time they improve. You can you can easily see how they improve from their results. So the second uh, section we have silicone uh, tubes that we use three millimeter and two millimeter tubes, and we use nine O sutures, same instruments, and with one approximation clip. We perform nine, uh, 12 anastomosis, three, like six end to end, six end to side, and, and uh, sorry, three end to side and three side to side anastomosis with nine O sutures. And for section three, we have chicken. We mostly perform uh, practice on chicken tie because of the familiarity of the anatomy and also. Uh, depth simulation we use tano and also like some some other materials that we use for better practice with chicken we do the same anosomosis type nine attempts at total and three and two and three and side and three side side attempts then we won't we move on to rat surgery. I prepare the rats and and expose the vessels. Then the fellow or trainee they they perform the anastomosis, and then we check together and if needed we we can correct the, the anastomosis practice. So who can perform such training? So I think this is really important to show such practice. So. Thomas, he was an undergrad student. He was uh, getting prepared for the med students, and he was like, uh, he was interested to complete our curriculum. We gave him the microscope and introduced everything, and that was he, one of his first attempts. As you can see here, this is the, the his last attempt, and there's a big difference. With enough attention, everyone can do such practice. He was not even a medical student. Right now, he is a second year medical student in our school. But that time, he was in uh, undergrad. Another example, 13 years old, Baran. I was in Istanbul last August, and she was... Uh, she joined the doctor, uh, Madame Freak courses, and... With just introduction from observer tubes, she started practice. This is her first practice, micro suturing with the silicone tubes, and this is her second practice. So you can even from that one to that one, you can see the difference. Then, then we gave him a rat with that rat, and she she performed two anastomoses after Madame Freak's demonstration, and just with my. Uh, introduction like my directions from the observatory i i rarely sit on and show something by myself but that also shows that she she was 13 years old the, how like who can do such practice even 13 years old with good instruction and good good uh, attention they she, she was able to make it and it was really really good example so in in Doug Bashke lab in 2020 we came up with a global outreach effort okay here in in our lab we have lots of international fellows and they can complete such training but no one should have to come to our lab to complete such training they should everyone should able to do such practice in their home country because there are lots of uh, difficulties to get people here so we, we start to get get those stereo microscopes from online auction source and test them and we got light sources different kind of instruments and made 
some training kits and then uh, I use those training kits. I feel comfortable, but all of our research fellows uh, in two, two, two and a half years, they also use those uh, instruments, those microscope. They feel comfortable then, then we start to send those microscopes to other places. So this is one of the, those microscopes that I found out that they were using for the real surgeries once in the 50s, uh, 1950s. Even Jacobson, the, one of the pioneers of microvascular surgery, he was using the same microscopes in, in his laboratory and here in like with real patients. So those are really high quality microscopes, stereo microscopes that, that give us, gave us whatever we need from a microscope, stereoscopic vision, magnification, and we can put different kind of light source, external light source to use them. Then we start to send those kits. This is our basic kits, light source, microscope, and uh, TV set. And this is our more extensive advanced uh, training kit. We send those to 19 low and middle income countries and reach out to 13 centers in those countries and try to initiate such practice in those countries. So this is just one example. My, my dear friend, Sharbat, he was from Lebanon and he spent some time in our lab. When he was going back to Lebanon, I gave him to microscope, some instruments, materials that then he returned back to Lebanon and then we did some trainings together and with two residents and they, they, they start doing those practiced by their own in, in Lebanon. Also, Sharbel helped us. So then I came up with the, like the uh, setup, including 10 microscopes and 10 instrument set, uh, and also one uh, demonstration microscopes, and start to organize course in a couple of different places. So I did a uh, one day, two day, and three day courses in nine centers, five different countries. In one day, we perform a uh, three anastomosis type using uh, paranoid drain and six O sutures. In two day courses, we included silicone tube with nine O, same anastomosis practice. In three day courses, we also include the chicken uh, practice. So, so far we, we did courses in Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Paraguay, and Mexico. I reached out to like uh, over 150 people and with those courses. After that, I like other than uh, those courses, we start to uh, initiate training in those centers with our donation. Wherever I go for the courses, I left a couple microscope and I share our resources, training videos, those people. So after I left, they, they, they were able to continue and do more practice by their own. And in, in Turkey, Istanbul, in Dr. Sabri's uh, place, we we opened the first microsurgery training room that we gave Professor uh, Başkayas in August, last August. For me, all those centers are like uh, such, such places that we can call. Those are the main outcomes, like a couple outcomes that I can show you uh, in our program. So in chat, our dear friend, Dr. Yannick, he completed our microvascular training uh, here in our lab, went back to chat. And in his country, in chat, there is no uh, trained surgeon to, to be able to do vascular uh, anastomosis for renal dialysis, hemodialysis patients. And he started doing such cases by himself. And so far he did 13 cases. And this is another case uh, that Dr. Sabri, uh, he did nerve anastomosis for uh, the uh, orthopedic colleagues. And here like another colleague from uh, India, Dr. Jayun, he performed first bypass cases after uh, completing our training here. He moved back to India and feel comfortable to do, start such practice. Another case uh, from Georgia, another fellow, he spent some time in our lab and did uh, complete our curriculum here. Then in January, uh, I visited their institution in Georgia, Tbilisi, Georgia, we did course. After the course, he did more uh, training and with his uh, chairman, they, they performed first 
bypass surgery for Moyamoye disease in, in the country a uh, couple, couple months ago. So all those uh, details uh, just accepted uh, in their surgery. Hopefully they will be available soon. And this is a team uh, work. So those are our team members from uh, 16 different countries. All of them are friends. They, uh, they, they visit our lab and they start to do such uh, teaching in their places. Also for courses and all other uh, things we do in search, uh, those countries, we have lots of other contribution organizations and individual collaborators. As you can see, special thanks to Dr. Demzi, our chairman. He is a well-known name in global neurosurgery, and he guides us and encourages us to do such practice. My two mentors, Dr. Turan and Dr. Bashka, without their uh, help, I couldn't make it. Uh, we couldn't make it. Those uh, things happen. Also, Professor Eshagi, the, the person that I most admired and learned a lot from him. And I would like to say, uh, close with his words, the better we see, the more we know, the more we know, the better we see. And this is our current lab uh, directed by Dr. Bashkaya. And those are like some some uh, recent fellows. After COVID, uh, we start to accept uh, fellows uh, in 2021, uh, May. And so far we had 16, uh, 56 fellows from 30 countries. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Kim Roy Sensei, please unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry. Thank you for your uh, excellent presentation, Dr. Professor Abdulos Keres. So, so informative, uh, informative lecture for us. So, Dr. Professor Basquez's curriculum, bypass curriculum, is so fantastic curriculum for us to learn the bypass technique. So. It, we learned it consists of four parts, the section one and using the uh using a uh artificial tube and section one and two and three and four and step by step day by day and uh, so the very 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 sometimes it costs to so uh very energetic we need so learn to learn the bypass techniques so is there any comment thanks. from the audience? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Na no, Nopu, do you have some yes. comment? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it was uh, really very nice to listen to Dr. Abdullah's talk. Uh, I had a very distinct privilege of meeting uh, Professor Bashka in Japan, Sapporo, uh, earlier this year in July. And I'm really impressed by his thoughts and his principles for a long time now. I have, I have also been a, a fellow with Professor Ture and Professor Yashargil. So, the, and I shared that with the, Dr. Abdullah here. My, my, I have a couple of comments and uh, questions. We should differentiate what is the difference between a workshop and a curriculum. You know, what he has shown, a curriculum with four sections, you know, uh, a workshop can be as long as a four or five days, whereas he has shown you a curriculum which lasts for a period of, I think, 17 days or 18 days, maybe close to 20 days. So people need to understand this. A workshop is a good thing, a very good thing, especially when you are guided by very good uh, teachers uh, like uh, Dr. Abdullah himself and Professor Bashka. Uh, but you need a proper curriculum. And for that, we we as as uh, as neuros as uh, uh, neurosurgeons, we need to establish more labs uh, and this. So just your thoughts on uh, difference between a workshop and a curriculum. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Nupur, for your comments. So I remember your time with Dr. Ture. I was there also at that time. So oh, thank great. you for your comments. So the, the workshop and the curriculum, it's totally different things. And, yes. and so like in normal courses that we have in Turkey also mm -hmm. here, so if, if 
people wants to come from all those countries, even from the same countries. They they have to sacrifice lots of things. They have to sacrifice their time. They have to sacrifice their money. Those courses are are gold standard. If if anyone can join, like can uh, attend those courses, this is the best thing that they can do. For example, the the course that we have in Istanbul or or here. But that's that's not the way for ev like everyone because like we have limited uh, conditions like limited numbers of participants a lot of other things so we should somehow reach out to people that cannot travel and come to our, our places for such courses and initiate such practice in those countries that that was our point uh, so and also in those courses after the course so this is just uh, like the initiating of a process yeah. So if you don't don't going to do more practice, and you're gonna learn like you're gonna forget almost everything in maybe just a couple couple months. So in the course of the, those workshops, you learn how to do it, but there is no way that you can in, like create a really good steady hands and improve your skills and muscle memory. You have to go back and do more and more. So, like, for, for our courses that organized in nine centers in five countries, we went there, those countries. We went those countries, those institutions. The people, the, the, the participants, they don't have to move another place, even in the country. And and, and we, we, one day, two day, or three days, we introduce how to do it. So, they and, and practice with those people together, and like when I living living to United States, wherever I go, I left at this couple microscope, and I I shared my training videos, and they 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 only need futures. They they can purchase online uh, from different different sources and do more by themselves. Here, if you have a new like since last two two years, whenever we get a new fellow in our lab. I introduce the whole curriculum as I did today here and give them whatever they need. And they do whole training by themselves. Such training is not new. As I showed that like in Donegal's in exactly. Berlin development, they start such curriculum. It was like one of the longest two, two weeks uh, curriculum. They start in 65. So it didn't change a lot. So still we do do like not same, not they did like 50 years, 60 years ago. So the main things didn't change. Okay, we have something different, but the main structure is yeah, almost the exactly. same. Therefore, exactly. we have to go back, see those pioneers, how they did it, and learn from those and like apply for today. I got inspired a lot from those pioneers, from Jacobson, from Kurz, from William House, from Professor Yashagil. So that's, 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 we, we try to initiate in those countries. Absolutely. Because, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in, in my time with Professor Tura and Professor Bashkaya, I saw their cases daily. Still today, I, I saw like every day I get into the and see Dr. Bashkaya's cases. So like after that point, like I saw the value of like the, the surgeries, of course, and, and I know how they reach out that level so yeah, that's yeah, why like yeah. i think those kind of training is still really important for everyone doing any kind of like cranial or spinal surgery absolutely absolutely i hope the younger people will be more and more encouraged by such talks and uh, they will take up this difficult work very difficult work of working in the lab it's not easy by uh, not easy by any standard my quick second question is just to highlight the importance of setup and instruments you see, Dr. Abdullah has taken so much care that everyone gets a proper setup and proper set of instruments, which is very important. You just can't start with whatever you have. And do, you should not be taking lab practice very lightly. Just this is my last question to you. You're in, just, you can just stress a little more on the importance of setup and instruments for the younger people. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you for paying attention that, uh, Dr. Nupur. And so this, the basic setup, so we should know that what we need from a microscope. That's the main thing that we should know that I learned from like the papers, the books from Yashagis and his talks, uh, also from Dr. Tres, like uh, uh, Dr. Tres, like the, the work. 
So you, you visit him and you probably saw his microscope. So it's kind of old microscope, yeah. but like one of the <laughs> best microscopes that you can see, you can yes, find. Yes, yes. So that yes, time yes. I spent in Utopia University with Dr. Ture, I learned what we need a microscope. Three main things we need from a microscope. First thing, magnification, of course. The second thing is, I think the, the most important thing is stereoscopy. You should able to see three dimensional with the microscope. So the third thing is the light source, which improved with the like microscope. But right now, it, uh, we have lots of different like external light source that we can easily use for, for our practice. So as I showed, like most basic setup, I have like stereo microscope that I found from our website. So, and it's, it's not very expensive. The cheapest one was like $13 that I found oh. here, just $13. But uh, average, I can say like mm -hmm. 100 to 200 it's, it's still like, for even my country, for Turkey, it's, it's a good money. But like, if you want to do something, you have to invest yes, yourself. Yeah. And That's the light true. source is like LED light, perfect for such training, external light source that we can put on a microscope. It's $25 in the United States. You can order from Amazon or in every country, like most of the countries, you can find very similar LED lights. The instruments that I use, it's, it's inspired by them, Julius Jacobson. So like uh, in one of the microsurgery books, he wrote a foreword and I read that foreword and he said like at the beginning, they didn't have any specific instruments designed for microsurgery because they were the first pioneers using microscope, yeah. right? So they didn't have proper instruments and he said, like, we got uh, some instruments from jewelry stores. So, and he said, like, we had one basic test to test is the good instrument, good force for microsurgery or not. He said, we put our back of our hands under the microscope and get the forceps and try to pick up a one hair follicle without slipping off cutting it. It, it, it can do it. That means it's a good instrument. He never right. give a name for that, but whatever he defined is a tweezer. We use tweezer for the same purpose. So I got yeah. inspired from that and try a lot of different tweezer sets and get the best ones right now. It's just ten dollars and it has eight forceps that we can use such practice. It's not excellent, but I use it. Lots of our fellows use it in those co like courses that we organize in five countries. 150 person used those and they were like the resident most resident we didn't have any issues so they are not excellent right. but they are the best ones that we can find ten dollar if you can just try to get any kind of micro instruments at least you have to pay a couple hundreds <laughs> regarding like ten dollars with eight eight four sets that that's something like i'm i'm like happy to introduce and we all uh -huh. all included in that paper hopefully it will get like it, it, it already accepted and hopefully it will be available soon and people great, great, great. read and learn from those. Right. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, thank, you, thank you. Professor Asura, could you give us a yeah. comment? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kimura. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. A very great presentation. And I think it's, it's amazing, amazing, you know. And uh, actually, I'm Asra, I'm from Indonesia, one of huge country and many people. <laughs> and also, I think uh, many young neurosurgeon from our country want to study about this technique. So I just want to ask you, is it possible that, uh, you know, we can invite you to make some uh, workshop here in Indonesia? And then, uh, of course, we want to get, you know, you can set up a laboratory, the branch laboratory of Pascal Laboratory in Indonesia. Is it possible? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Th thank you for your comments. So, like, right now, like, we reach out 19 countries, and in most of them, like, uh, we detail explain everything. In maybe half of those places, we just donate one microscope and instrument that I can train at least like 10 residents with just one microscope, one lighter, one instrument in a year. So, our curriculum is like 20 days at most. Let's say, like, two months, like because of like the workload of those residents, they can complete in two months. Every two months, we can give it to another resident and they can complete it. 
So like we should keep everything basic to make it available for everyone. So and uh, right now we are trying to reach out as much as we can and organize courses. And believe it or not, in a couple different places, I organized those courses for neurosurgeons, but we had orthopedic surgeons. And we have other all like microvascular surgeons there. And we are trying to uh, organize another course in Turkey with just only general surgeons. So they have really good problem. They like after mastoidectomy surgeries, they have big problem about like lymph edema and they are planning to initiate such lymph uh, and venous uh, anastomosis to deal with that problem. So hopefully after our course, they will do more and more. And also we are trying to or collaborate with like organizations. So we, we're going to hopefully have a course in with Turkish uh, Nursery Society in their uh, national congress. So hopefully we can we can do yeah. collaboration in Indonesia. I would like to have, uh, but we should consider it later. Uh, it depends on availability and also time timing. Thank you. Thank you. A great effort for paying uh, to training the basketball uh, training bypass training. Yeah, fantastic effort. Thank you. So, uh, Thanks so much. Uh, Sujan, do you have some question, Sujan? Dr. Sujan? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Abdullah Kalis, uh, for your brilliant uh, presentation on this uh, uh, practice workshop. You make a good uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, you just uh, turning the vision into realities, uh, I would say. So I have one question uh, that uh, uh, do you have any experience uh, uh, on uh, regarding the microvascular anastomosis on uh, anesthetized chicken or live chicken? No, no, we, we don't have any any experience with live chicken. I think it's not practical here in the United States. We, therefore, we have a rat surgeries for, but the, the best and most available, cheapest, like matter is the chicken. So we use like panel drain to get used to it, microscopic magnification and working on the microscopic magnification. Also, we use silicone tubes and like three millimeter, two millimeter, because it's really easy. Like if you perform, try to go and uh, jump with the, like, start with the uh, chicken vessels, you will have really troubles. You will get in trouble because the lumen is not open. With those silicone tubes, lumen is always open and it's much easier to initiate such practice with the like artificial uh, vessels like, like silicone. But like this is good for the beginning, but if you want to do more and more, the only thing that you need is chicken. If you have animal or if you have some, some places they have placenta, if you have those, they are really good. You should you should definitely use those, but in most places they don't have rat, they don't have like placenta, so chicken is good. And since it's not like live tissue, there is no like a real qualification for like the uh, checking their like uh, quality regarding like the pressure. But still, you can you can put some fluids and also like calculate like the pressure and test it against the pressure. But like, this is not the, like the main thing that you have to do. Like, like you have to do the best practice you can do on like with, with, with uh, chicken vessels. And whenever you have time, you should start practice on the human. Like if you injured, accidentally injured a vessel, don't, don't coagulate it. You should try it. If you have like sutures, you should spend some time. You can, you can start like uh, practicing such uh, fine sutures, arachnoid closure. We, we published a really good uh, video paper with Dr. Ture that he did arachnoid closure on cisterna magna. Here, Dr. Bashka, he asked like each, each chief uh, residents to do it also in poster for surgery. After the surgery, he gave them uh, the patient and they closed the arachnoid. So this is another good practice. Or Thank like, you, like if you like, use microscope for every part of the surgery and pay attention to those that that's gonna like by time improve and you you're gonna do more and more so mm -hmm. you, like like if you don't do it you can start to even like start to close like do under the microscope that's another good yes, practice in real patients 
So that's that's really important, I think, for new new uh, residents and surgeons. Thank you for your explanation. Yeah, excellent thank message you. for young neurosurgeon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, thank you, Professor, uh, another comment, another question on chat channel. Chat, uh, Himash, Dr. Himash Rabal, uh, using the Kihara your your comment, yeah, your question. Could you give us a comment? Okay. Yeah. Mash. Himashi, Himashi, you are now to speak and uh, you can, can you ask the question? Okay. Yes. Okay, yeah, I, I think. I can read and uh, yeah reply the question. So it's if you have like the such uh, cadaveric laboratory, it's it's good to have because like you can simulate like same surgery that you do on patients for like STMCA bypass cases, and but the the thing is that for cadaveric uh, tissue, mostly they are fixed. If you get fresh frozen or fresh cadavers, that's the best one that you can use. But mostly they are like uh, fix it with alcohol or formaldehyde and they are stiff. So like if you have it, that's that's great. Definitely I, I suggest to use it in our lab. We have we use for such practice and we simulate like same same uh, procedures, real procedures. But if you don't have like fresh frozen, you might consider to just do more practice on on chicken vessels because they are they are easily available and they are also like a, like biological materials. But even like for cadaveric tissue, like you know, there is difference between intracranial and extracranial arteries. So and you should pay attention and try to do practice with both with veins also because for bypass we also use veins for other purposes. So there are lots of things to use, but like we should keep the things basic and simple to make it available for everyone. If you have more, of course, it's better to use more uh, better uh, instruments, better uh, microscope, better uh, materials. But like even though those basics are are I think enough for lots of things. Yeah, uh, I accept. I understood. Uh, I totally agree with your comment. We have to daily practice to learn the bypass technique you think that chicken is better for us maybe yeah thank you it's yeah okay. so i have a, another comment about like daily practice so if you are practice surgeons so you are using the same skills same hand same manipulation you should use for every kind of surgeries so i daily get into or and see dr bashir's cases and whenever i see like like you can consider maybe easy case like like uh, convex to meningiomas but they are mostly involved with like the veins. And this is one of the best practice that you can ever see in like dissection of those veins, like from the tumors. That's the whole like same practice, same micro techniques that we use like for advanced sectomy, I can say like, so like if you are practicing daily, if you're performing surgeries daily, you don't have to go and do this like anosomal practice. It's, it's same thing, same hand, same manual skills. So up to some point, like I think the the only place that you should uh, train, like do more training, is the surgeries. Yeah, excellent comment. Thank you. Okay, any other comment? <laughs> I think there is a last question from the chat box, uh, by Doctor Sukiti, the fellow at the Fujita Health uh, University. Uh, uh, the question is: Do you recommend this training as a basic neurosurgeon, or do you want? Uh, only the subspecialist, uh, subspecialist to do this. So um... yeah, that that's a good question. So like you remember that I showed two people uh, that able to do such practice. One was undergrad students, which was getting prepared for med school, and the other one was uh, recently uh, she did really good uh, practice. Uh, Thirteen years old girl. So. There is no limit for like who can do it, who should do it. As soon as you can do it, it's better because you're gonna see like the you're gonna improve your practice. So there's no no logic to wait until like as a like being a specialist. 
I think the first year resident they should start doing it and and maybe like like with time they should do more and more. So there is no limit who can do it or where like when they they each each train is each surgeon do it. I think as soon as possible when they start their their training, no surgery training, residency. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Yes, so, um, Professor Kimura says so. There's hey. no further questions. So, um, yes. let's invite. Yes. Uh, could you have some comment? Give us some comment. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank, thank yes. you very much. So today we had a very nice uh, the three talks, and of course from the last. Uh, thank you very much, the Kellis. So the Baskaya recommended you as one of the top uh, the fellow his place so that's why we invited you thank you very much and you're taking thank care you. of the so many fellows from the world and i think uh, they uh, became very good the bypass surgeon i think at least thank you very much please continue and also thank uh, uh, you uh, maybe uh, we should learn more the anatomical standpoint i think uh, the, we encountered so many uh, variation of the vessels. So when we decide, so this vessel is uh, crucial or not. <clears throat> but uh, I, I think uh, auto sensei, such, like, like auto sensei uh, study, is, they may help when we decide to do the surgery. And also, once we encounter the unexpected things, maybe I think uh, we can do more better uh, result. And thank you, wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. And second one is a female doctor from Bangladesh, uh, the Dr. Nazmin, and she is she talks to us uh, uh, about the glioma. Maybe I, I think Dean uh, Shot Sensei may help her. I think in the future because, because he is a very good uh, uh, awake surgery expert in Asia now. I think. So and uh, uh, I think that's when you may visit Japan anytime, even short term, and then we can uh, take care of you. Uh, you should see the our exercise you see. So the, thank you very much, uh, Kimura Sensei. Very, very good chairs, and also of course uh, we thank you very much for the discussions, the Professor Nipu, <clears throat> and also the uh, Asha. So uh, Asha is. Uh, uh, Top leader, the uh, one of the top leader of the Asia now. I think uh, uh, he is busy for preparation of the uh, in Cape Town now. I think, and also the Dr. Ben, uh, he works so hard as as always. And so many uh, participants. So, yeah. Thank you. I find. Yes. Thank you so much, and uh, and uh, thank you so much. okay. So see you yes. next time. So, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the educational committee uh, of ACNS YNS, I would like to thank you all first uh, for joining me today. I would like to thank you, Professor Kato, again for uh, his uh, kindness for organizing uh, this webinar, and also our chairs today, Professor uh, Kimura. Thank you for supporting uh, us uh, this in these two days for the ACNS. And also, uh, as the, thank you uh, for the speaker, Professor uh, Ota, and also uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Nasmin Ahmed, and also uh, Professor Kiris. And also, I've discussed today, uh, Professor Dupo, and also Professor es uh, Esra. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Happy to see you all, and uh, and uh, very glad to see uh, all of you here. And also, uh, last but not least, uh, my friends, uh, Dil Short, and also Dr. Jui Sam, thank you uh, so much for uh, moderating this session uh, uh, with me. So uh, again, it's a uh, bye bye to all of us. So I uh, hope to see you next time. Very meaningful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice time in the